Last Sunday, as uh, I believe was leaving, she said, because our lesson is about uh, the bucket list and what would you like to accomplish or do before you are called by the Lord. And as she was leaving, she said, uh, she said several things, but she said, and one in particular, that you never know, you never know. It could be long, it could be short. And I had had no idea what the Lord had planned just, just two and a half days later. You notice the uh, slideshow was revealing because there were several things on her bucket list that that she achieved and that she wanted to do. She wanted to go to Florida. And one of the things, I believe, on the way to Florida, uh, she stood underneath a tree that had a lot of moss. And it, and it gave her the, gave the impression that she was wearing this wig. <laughs> she got a kick out of that. She uh, came to church. Uh, six months or so ago, how long it was, I don't recall, but she came up and she said, I want to show you what I'm wearing. And she had this picture of this moss wig, and she got a kick out of that. Of course, we saw her um, teaching the rules to play dominoes, and, <laughs> and we've all learned from her in that area. And, you know, she also was quite educated. She had gone to uh, college, uh, her <coughs> bachelor's degree, and also had attained the master's degree. Some of you might not, not have known that, that she was actually a quite educated lady. And uh, she taught um, elementary education, but she specialized in, in children with disabilities. And so that was, uh, that was just a, a unique thing about her and very special for her. She loved uh, talking about her, her life and where she had been with her husband. I didn't realize she had self-taught herself how to play the piano. She had tore down an entire piano and rebuilt it apparently on her own. And uh, uh, doing something like that requires um, uh, resolve and dedication, but it also re it requires uh, some of belief in yourself. So she had a healthy belief in herself and a confidence about herself. When it comes to making goals and, and plans for the future, uh, the first thing you need to do is make a list. And it may be only one thing. It might be simply to graduate high school or college. It may be uh, to buy a new car. It may be to, to build a house. Whatever that list might be. Last Sunday we talked about how God is a God of plans. He's a God who makes plans. And he, he devises all these plans. And he, and he sets these plans in order. And God is a God of planning. Why not us? I've heard... People say that they don't like and they don't agree with having goals. They don't agree with having plans. I've heard people say that. I've even heard church leaders say that. And looking at it from a positive point of view, I can understand why we might uh, look at it that way because is that limiting God? If, if we have a plan, we're limiting God. Well, the answer would be if it's God's will, then what greater plan is there? If God's will is for you to go to college, and to become a, uh, a school teacher or an accountant, whatever it may be, or a counselor, whatever it, it is that, that the Lord has put on your heart, that is an item for you to write down, to cherish, to, to live for, to dream about. It's your vision, and it becomes part of your faith. What is faith? Believing Faith is believing in something you can't see. And faith is being sure of what you hope for. Hebrews 11.1, 1, meaning to say faith is essentially having a vision. Faith is having a dream of something in the future. Don't let someone who's given up on their own dream, don't allow someone who's given up on their own dream to talk you out of yours. Don't do that. Don't listen to people who are going to talk you away from where the Lord wants you to be with your life. It may be that the Lord has planned for you to, to go somewhere, to be something. But what you've got to do is first, first, the first and foremost thing is to make a list. And again, it may be only one item. The very moment, the very moment one definitely commits himself, then God moves too. All sorts of things occur to help that would never wise have occurred. You know who wrote those words? Then he goes on. Unforeseen events that God moves through. Meetings and material assistance 
which no man could have dreamed, would have come his way. He said, once you definitely commit yourself, then God moves. Of course, he begins moving before then. You know who wrote that? That was the guy who wrote the story be behind the blockbuster movie right now, Les Miserables. I don't know how you say that. But his name is Johann Wolf Wolfgang von Goethe. He wrote that story. So now that, that, that story is, is just all over the map. It's just all over the world. It's, it's probably going to win an Oscar uh, one of these days. But he was a believer in God. He believed that once you dedicated yourself, and he lived in a very difficult time. He lived in France where society was falling apart, much worse than it is now, uh, back in the 1800s, 1820s, and 1830s. And he saw things just miserable. People were miserable. That's why the name of the movie is, in English, The Miserable. Les Miserables, if that's how you say it. <laughs> that's not how you say it. Uh, don't quote me then. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. That man passed away a few months ago. He's the man who founded Apple. And he said that just a few months before he passed away, Steve Jobs. He said, remember that you're going to die is the best way to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. Eventually, we're all going to die. I used the phrase last Sunday, to kick the bucket. So before we kick the bucket, what do we do? We write down a list, and, and, we, and whether it's actually written down on a piece of paper, but we put it in our heart, and we say, Lord, I believe this is where you called me. I believe this is what you want me to do, and I will do this. Make a list. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 16, Without vision, my people will perish. That's the verse. If you don't have a dream, if you don't have a vision, if you don't have some kind of a channeling plan that keeps you focused on a mark, you get off focus and you die. Very similar to a plane flying into fog. If you can't see your destination, then you'll hit the tower. In 1945, the tallest structure in New York City, Empire State Building, was struck by a plane. In 1945. Why? Because he flew, he flew right into the fog and he hit the Empire State Building. With no vision, you'll perish. And what he means by that, if you don't have a dream in your heart of what you want to be, where you want to go, your heart will slowly die. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday. But today, is, the, the, the point is, today is having a dream gives you a vision and it gives you a purpose. But when you allow somebody to talk you out of it, then you die, you perish, because you don't know which direction to go. You're not sure where to go, here or there. And so slowly, eventually, you, sl you slowly wilt up and die. Christmas Day in 2012, a flight from Burma, and I can't pronounce the name of the airliner, but it crashed in Burma. And this is just hardly even... Not even a month ago, all 44 people on board perished. Why? Because if the plane came in in fog, it missed the runway and it went off to the side. This is happening everywhere. This is happening all around the world. People who don't have vision, who don't have a direction in their life, eventually they die. I would strongly recommend each and every mission team each and every ministry team here at Mission Christian Church to develop a vision of where you want to go. I understand it's scary. I understand it tends to constrict you, but sometimes that's what you need. You need some sort of guideline. The worship ministry team needs guidelines. They need vision for the future. What are we going to do when we have more people who come who are talented? Or are we done? Or is it... I said, nobody else is going to come who's talented. That's not true. We're going to have more people over the years that will come. And we have this vision for someone we haven't even seen. And what will we do with them and for them? How will we put them to work? Without vision, people will perish. Without a purpose, without a dream, without a reason to be, 
there's no reason to be there. Why? Because I'm not being used. I'm not useful. This morning, don't listen to other people too much. They may have some good advice, but when God lays on your heart to have a dream and a purpose, please don't listen to other people. You got your message from God. You didn't get it from them. And if you got it from other people, it's not God. God will speak to you. He will give it to you. Listen to Him. I had all kinds of people trying to talk me out of becoming a preacher and a missionary over the years. My goodness, you would not believe the number of people who have not intending to say bad things, but they just didn't understand the dream. They didn't understand the vision. They didn't understand. And I don't know that they ever would or that they ever will. But if I had listened, I probably would have totally gone a different direction in my life. And thank God I didn't listen because I honestly believe that this was God's plan. This was His will. This was His vision for my own personal life. So, where do we go next? Number two, take a risk. The Bible says, make a list. But then it says, take a risk. You're going to try those things that you've never done before, possibly. Or you're going to try something that really entails a risky venture, so to speak. As you risk yourself, as you risk your talent or your money, it means a lot because you're putting it out there. You're risking it, not somebody else. It means you are vested in it. And it's, it's part of you. Why, why did I suggest that we do a pledge drive for a youth minister? Why? I did that so that you might participate in the dream. Because once you are vested in that, you're vested in that, that becomes a part of you. You might say, well, I don't have any money. Praise God. Well, you can commit to prayer is what you could do. And you could constantly tell the young people and whoever's involved in that ministry, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you because I'm vested in this. This is part of my dream now, so to speak. Whenever you take a, ri uh, take a risk, you eventually have to decide, am I going to step out there and do something that's really risky? In 2 second, <coughs> second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Probably the greatest way to test yourself is to do something that is highly risky. Jump out of an airplane <laughs> without a parachute and let the other guy catch you. Come on now. Now that's a real risk. Anybody can take a parachute down, right? But the guy that's really, you know, he's, he's, he's got the, the risk factor figured out. He'll jump out and say, hey, dude, catch me. I'll, I'll see you down at the bar. You're going to see each other at the bottom one way or the other. <laughs> it may not be a pleasant experience. I know that uh, some of you are bike riders and some of you are dirt bike riders. And, and I saw this picture. I thought of uh, dirt bike riders who, who take their lives in their own hands <laughs> when they jump hills. And, and, and they are people that generally uh, enjoy taking a risk. But this is not really about uh, not riding bikes. It's about what? It's about our faith. There are three things that you should be concerned about in this risk. Number one, of course, it's not number one, but it's your finances. Will you risk your finances? Will you risk your finances to, say, go into business? Will you risk your finances to go back to school, back to college? One of the things I appreciated about um, Iva Lee was her desire to finish her education. And she graduated from college the same time that Kevin was graduating from high school. And that, that's a special thing to me because that's exactly what happened to me. My mother graduated and exactly at the same time I was graduating uh, from school as well. But there's a financial risk involved because y you might fail. You might not do well. You might be a laughing stock when you attempt to do this and, and you find yourself not reaching the goal that you set out to do in the way that you thought that you were going to do it. And it's a risky proposition because your name is at stake. You say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to join a particular ministry team. And you're all gung-ho and you want to do this and you want to help the church in a particular way. But it doesn't quite work out the way you thought it was going to work out. 
And so you have to learn that there's a certain amount of risk to your own sense of self-worth and, and who you are. To your own safety, the safety of your reputation, whether by physically or, or, or not, or emotionally. And it may be also a risk to your relationships. There may be somebody in this church who does not want you to get involved. Why? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, you'll have to figure that out through pr prayer and maybe talking. But there may be somebody who doesn't want you to get involved. And so uh, you're, you're chomping at the bit. I want to get involved in this or in that. And somebody else doesn't want you there. Why? That's their territory. And they don't want you involved in that territory. And all of us, you're saying, but wait a minute. God called me to do it. How do I do this? If, if God wants me to do this, how do I do this? If God wants me to do this, I'm getting really frustrated because I can't do this. I've seen that happen many, many times over the years and in and, and many different churches. And, and eventually you have to push through. You have to say, don't let anybody talk you out of the dream that God laid on your heart. They may give up on theirs and they may give up on yours, but you were called by God. You must push forward and persevere. It's worth the risk. Number three, you've taken the risk, and now what? Now the really important part isn't it? You, you make a decision, okay, I'm going to do this. And number two, it's risky proposition. But number three, what is it? What is it all really about? It's really about changing our life, isn't it? It's about doing something that maybe we haven't done before, something that is unique. And you know what? Sometimes we look at this and we think of something physical. I know that the number one, the number one uh, New Year's resolution is always weight, number one, in the United States. Not in Israel, not in the home place of Jesus, but in the United States of America. Number two, it's exercise. Not in Israel, not in the home place of Christ, not in his culture, ours. That's what's so important to us, is the way we look and the way we come across and the way we present ourselves and the way we can run or move and, and do things actively or not. I heard somebody, uh, I heard of somebody, not, not in this church, not too long ago, say something very derogatory about people who don't exercise. And, and I thought, what? How could you be so prejudiced about that? As if somebody who doesn't exercise can't be happy, can't be disciplined, can't, what? We put too much emphasis on changing the external things of life instead of changing life. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is. There's something more important here than changing a body part, isn't there? Now think about it. You can, you can be 17 or you can be 15 years old, and you climb a utility pole. You shouldn't be up there, but you do. And your name is Christian Candlebar. That's his name. And at 15 years old, he climbed this utility pole. And <laughs> utility poles are hot wired, by the way. And he touched it, and it just sizzled his arm. And it sizzled his hand off. So change your life. Take a risk. Do something you've never done before. Have a vision. Go to a doctor. Change your hand. And he did. This man is the first man recorded to have a hand attached that was controlled by the brain. Breakthrough technology. Breakthrough technology. Never had been done before. Can you imagine taking, your, taking a, 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 just a robotic foot and putting it on your leg, and now your brain can control it? And it's almost like it's a part of your brain. It's amazing what we've done in technology. You talk about changing a life? No, it didn't change it. If you looked at his blog, it would say, you got to live for yourself. Very selfish person. you got to live for yourself. And it's all about you and being happy in this world. He died two years ago in a car accident. Change life? Yeah, change life. If you change your hand, do you change your life? No, that's not the important part. The important part is something that's inside of you that changes inside of you. You can get on a treadmill. You can get on a diet plan. Or you can get on 
all these other things that are external things that eventually are so minor in comparison to the essential nature of your heart that needs to be changed. Your heart needs to be changed. And that is by far the most important thing. And we talked about that last Sunday. So, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, change your life. Now what do you do? Let it go. This is one of the hardest things to do. <laughs> letting, letting go in the past, you know. What's happened in the past? Just, just letting it go. And just saying, okay, today's a new day. That's much easier said than done. My goodness, how hard this can be. But if you think about it, this is probably one of the most in, uh, difficult things for people to do. How did God call Peter, Andrew, James, and John to let it go? How did he do that? When they, were, when they were out in the fishing boat and Christ came along and he said, Hey, Peter. I don't know if he called him Pete or Peter. Hey, Pete. <laughs> he probably did. Hey, Peter. And, Pete. and Pete comes over and he says, Hey, drop your net, follow me. How did he have to let it go? What was he letting go? Oh, my goodness. He had to let go of, of his trust in the finances because he was a businessman. He was a fisherman. And now he had to let those things go. He had to say, okay, I'll let those things go. He had to let his relationship with his father and mother go. He had to, to finally say, okay, if I'm going to go with Christ, I have to let it go. But you know what? Pete was, Peter was oblivious to the whole fact of who Christ was at this point. He didn't understand that Jesus Christ was God and that going with Jesus, and if Jesus Christ claimed to be God, that was a death penalty case. And Peter, if you walk with this guy and if you let it go, this is risky business. Because if you let it go, you can die too. I never thought about that before, if you were Peter. But you're going to have to let it go. You get halfway down the road and all of a sudden you hear Jesus saying something like, well, I am God. I'm from heaven. Oh, wait a minute, Jesus. <laughs> Jeez, you slow down here. You know, because, you know why? Because you're saying that you're God, you could get us all killed. Can you back off the talk a little bit? You know, that's a little bit too strong. Uh, Jesus said, no, no, no. They're, they are going to beat you silly, Peter. And once you have turned, strengthen the brothers. Take care of them. No one looking back, it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 62. No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So you, 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 you have your list and you write it down and, and you take a risk and, and you decide to change your life and, and the more important things inside, not necessarily external. And then you go from there and you say, okay, I'm going to have to let it go. One of the, the greatest ways of letting it go is burying the past and saying, okay, I'm going to bury the past. We call that baptism in the New Testament. Baptism is really a, a burying of the past, isn't it? It's just dirty water out there in the Jordan River. You take Peter out there to the Jordan River and you say, Pete, I'm going to dunk you. <laughs> and I'm not going to hold you down too long because that would be fatal. But I'm going to hold you down just long enough for you to get the point. And he comes back up and he's what? He's a new person. Maybe. It's, it depends on if he's really made that decision to let it go and to say, okay, I'm going to follow Christ and I'm going to start over and really uh, begin a new life without any, without any. I think this is the hardest part. With no regrets. <laughs> this is the part of the sermon that I absolutely uh, wish I could teach more clearly. I wish I could Practice it more clearly and more consistently. I wish I could do this all the time. It's sort of like saying you need to love God with all your heart. Yes, we do. But can you do it all the time? Uh, it's very hard to do it all the time. And this is equally difficult. Learning to have no regrets. No regrets. Do you regret what happened two years ago? You're going to have to learn to get over that. You have to learn to have no more regrets. I'm not saying you forget. I did not say forget. I said regret. Regret is where you go back 
you regress to that point in time and you go, oh, bummer, I can't believe I did that. Oh, bummer, I can't believe I, I can't believe that was done. I did that. But you have to go back. You have to start from this day on. You have to say, I will live my life without regrets. Otherwise, it will kill you as a Christian. It says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. When you come before the Lord and you say, I want to bury the past. Great. Well, you can bury the past, but sometimes you know where you buried it. <laughs> so you can go dig it up again. You know what I mean? But burying the past means it's running water. By the way, it's running water. The Jordan River was running water. Because when you got buried in the Jordan River, Pete, all the sins went down the river. Why? Because it's a running river. I'm using that as a metaphor. For you to go find those sins and live in them again and to say, okay, I can't believe I did that. I was so stupid. I can't believe that. I, I was so dumb. I did these things and boy, I'm a jerk. And now you beat yourself up over and over and over and over again. You keep going over the sins over and over. That's because you know exactly where you buried them and you go dig it up and you bring it back and you begin to unlock it and open it and you begin to think about all the bad things you ever did. And the Bible says the sorrow of the world produces death. As we consider this morning our relationship with God and making a so-called bucket list. There may be only one item on there. It might be, okay, I'm just, I'm going to decide to become involved in the church, you know. Or I'm, I'm going to decide to give my life to Christ again. I'm going to start over. Or maybe I'm going to re rededicate myself. Whatever it may be is, is your list. And I, and I appreciate those other lists, those physical lists. Okay, now we're going to get out of debt or now we're going to lose weight, whatever. Those things are, can be important, but generally speaking, many of those things are so low on the totem pole that I don't know that you need to burn up too much energy focusing on those issues over and over. The more important issue is your regret because your past will come back to haunt you. Your past is your worst enemy and you will use it like a g bullet and a gun. And you can use it to shoot yourself. And people do. Left and right. People go back to the past over and over. And they get steeped into this guilt. Into this self-condemnation. They simply can't allow themselves to simply let go of the regret. The sorrow that is according to the, world of, word of, uh, to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Tough, isn't it? We might need to pray about it. As we close this morning, the last point is just live it, do it, <coughs> meaning to say, let's go. One of, uh, one of Iva Lee's, I almost called her the name of a lady down in, in Ada, Blanchard Monroe, who remind, Sandy and I were talking about how they're so much, so much alike. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that... Um, I really appreciated about Iva Lee was her fa one of her favorite verses. She said, faith without works is dead. James 2.17. You can say, I'm going to get to the other side of the mountain. I'm going to get on my bike and I'm going to go. Or I'm going I'm to Paris sail over there. Or however you're going to get there, you're going to walk. But eventually you have to do it. You have to get up and you have to say, okay, I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to to take action. Eventually, it's a matter of letting go of the past and saying, I'll start again and I'll begin something new. Some of you may not have known that Steve Jobs had been fired from Apple. He was actually fired. Steve Jobs was a very demanding CEO, very pushy, very demanding, and he got fired. Canned. They kicked him out, got rid of him. This is the guy who built Apple. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced 
by the lightness of being a beginner again. Less sure about everything, it freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. Steve Jobs got fired, terminated. He went out and started another company. And that thing took off. Eventually, eventually Apple came back to Steve Jobs and said, we want you back. And they took him back. But one of the greatest events in his life was this thing getting fired. Meaning to say, he could have used that as intense regret about his life. But what he set out to do was to start over and to say, I'm just going to have to do it. It reminds me of the words of God as we close. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this. You know, this is going to get done. It may take 10 years. It may take 20 years. I'm going to do it. It, it. I planned it. I will do it. And that is God talking. Not you. Not me. But now what we need to do is to take the mind of God. And take the mind of God and say, okay, I've got a plan. I believe this is from the Lord. I planned it. God's behind me. I will do it. Surely I will do it. You make a decision this morning. I don't know what your decision is this morning. What is it? What's that list that we're going to start out with this morning? We're going to sing a song of encouragement and an invitation. And it might be that you're ready this morning to, to do something different, to start over. It, maybe you just need a prayer for wisdom. Uh, something that sometimes the hardest thing to figure is just what is the will of God. And you might need to talk to other church uh, experienced leaders, men and women, who, who might guide you on that, that journey. As we prepare for this song, let's bow together and let's pray. Father in heaven, as we have come, Lord, this morning to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. Lord God, we acknowledge, Lord, that you are a God of great plan, a, a great design, and great dreams. Help us, Lord, to, to understand your mind and to take those things of your nature, Lord God, and, and cause them to be a part of our life. Lord, as we make our decision this morning, and as we realize that the risk is, is involved in it, Lord God, reveal that to us as time goes by. And help us, Lord, to change our heart and our minds, and, and help us to reach out and change other people as well. Lord, help us to, to just keep focused on the future and, and what's happening and what's going to happen in the future, uh, learning to let go of our regrets. So Lord, as we stand and as we give you the honor, glory, and the praise, help us to put you first in all things. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing The Way of the Cross Leads Home. And uh, <clears throat> it might be that uh, you need prayer. You just need prayer. And we are here this morning to pray with you and for you. And I pray that you'll, you'll determine and figure out that voice of God, what is it He wants for you? Let's sing.